I've been looking for you everywhere. Really? Everywhere? Goodness, don't tell me I was missing again. <laughs> no, you know what I mean. It's Wednesday. I thought you'd be with Mom. And being such a predictable human being. There's nothing predictable about you, Abuela. <laughs> I have such a smart granddaughter. Yes, you do. And so humble, too. Mom said I'd take after you. Really? <laughs> <laughs> it was a compliment. Uh-huh. And what was the compliment for? This. Which is? Here. Ay, Dios bendito, you've been accepted to Our Lady of the Lake University. My little girl is going to be accepted! Yes, <laughs> Because of Father Moy and his beliefs that girls should receive an education, thousands of young women have received an education, not just here in San Antonio, but around the world. How? Through faith and providence. Oh, I forget you're my little historian. Don't blame me. I get from you, Dr. Ryan. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> All right, we'll start at the beginning. First, what do you know about Father Moy? Mm, he was French. And he started the Sisters of Divine Providence. And do you know why? Mm, not really. He saw inequity in the treatment of young girls and felt that they should receive an education. Now, this is in the late 1700s, so you can imagine that things didn't go over so well, especially considering his methods. Which were? By sending young women out into rural communities alone to help educate those he believed needed this instruction. He even had strict guidelines for the women he sent out. They weren't to have a fixed income or salary. They even had to live with those they taught and share in their lives. Wasn't it dangerous? Considerably. <laughs> he had faithful followers, like Marguerite Lecomte, one of the first women he sent out to help implement his project, who also believed in doing whatever she could to help alleviate the misery of those she served. I can't imagine taking that kind of a risk. It's not a risk if you have faith. And he did. A deep, abiding faith. Providence guides and directs everything, the good and the bad, consolations and afflictions. Everything comes from his fatherly hands, and everything must tend to his glory and our sanctification. If we accept it as coming from him, and if we use it for the purpose he sends to us. The women who supported his project believed it so, and were just as diligent which he found true even during his missionary work in China, where he continued his project. Here we have virtuous women, and also girls, who possess a zeal and a courage above their sex. They fear neither the height of the mountains, nor the distances of the places, nor persecutions, nor death. Like the apostles, they go and preach, counsel, instruct, convert the pagans, edify the Christians, baptize the children, and establish religion everywhere. It is they who do nearly all the good. They have a wonderful talent for speaking soundly, methodically, and clearly. They understand what I say, and then they retain, repeat, and explain all my instructions. They, too, suffer humiliations, but their irreproachable conduct, full of prudence, silences everyone. Even the pagans respect them and listen to them. It is they who convert them. He spent 10 years as a missionary in China, then returned to France to continue his work. But it was difficult. He seemed opposed at every turn. There was a huge anti-religious movement that swept through France during the French Revolution and forced many of the religious to flee, including Sister Marguerite and Father Moy, who died May 1793 in exile in France. Then how did the project continue? 
Providence in 1802, a year after Bonaparte Concordant with the Holy See was signed. The Sisters of Pro Providence resumed the teachings of the rural poor. They even received some financial support from the government, which increased over time. With this support, they were able to accept more novices and expand their educational reach. And that's how they got to Texas? <laughs> Not exactly. They came to Texas by invitation. Bishop Dubois was in dire need of priests and nuns. At the time, there was less than two dozen novices serving the entire state. He came to France to solicit volunteers. Three sisters from the congregation volunteered, but only two actually came. Sister Alphonse Vogler and Sister Andrew Felton, who was named Mother Superior of the province in Texas. The two sisters left with Bishop Dubois in 1886, and they came to the U.S. with a special mission. Everywhere, rural schools for girls. 1866. That's right after the Civil War. That could have been easy for you. No. First, I have to cross the Atlantic then make the trek from New York to Texas, and then once here, deal with the general threat of lawlessness and the Indian Wars, plus unfinished roads, minimal communication, and the vast expanses of unpopulated and unsettled land. Why would they put themselves through all of that? They felt compelled by God to continue the work of Father Moy. It's just amazing to me, Abuela, how people deliberately pursue their dreams and ideas, knowing how hard it's going to be, the challenges they're going to face. I don't know if I could ever be that strong. But you are. I don't think so. This letter says differently. Do you know how many young women want to go to college but don't? Because they'll be killed? I'm not talking about that. <laughs> I'm talking about right here in San Antonio. They don't go because they're afraid. They are afraid they're not smart enough or worthy enough of an education. It's a big deal you being accepted and deciding to face the challenge of a higher education. What you see as an easy and natural course of life, many don't. I didn't. A college education was an impossible dream that only certain special people could obtain, which definitely didn't include a poor Hispanic girl from the west side of San Antonio. But the CDPs made it possible for me and so many other young Hispanic and black women. That is what compelled the sisters to come to no man's land, to face the hardships of the wild, unsettled West. They wanted to make education possible for everyone, and they had faith that Providence would provide. They lived their calling, just as you're living yours to be a documentary filmmaker. <laughs> <laughs> Mother Andrew knew things would be difficult, but she continued in faith, believing that Providence would provide. She established the first mother house in Festerville and accepted the first novice, Anna Schultz, in 1868. Under Mother Andrew, the parish grew and more schools were opened. But then, in 1986, some priest asked Bishop Neraz for her deposition. They wanted to remove her? Why? They accused her of scandal mongering that in she declared herself innocent now, <laughs> like she was up against four powerful priests. What? It's a long sword story about a priest and a young novice from Brownsville. You can read about it. <laughs> Sister Callahan provides a detailed account of what happened. I'll lend you the book if you're interested. Oh, I'm interested. <laughs> I know what people say on that But suffice to say, Mother Andrew struggled and tried to establish more parishes around Texas and then California, but she was stopped every time by Bishop Naraz. It is no use to look for favor from the Bishop of San Antonio. Though his lordship is treating me worse than if I had been a malefactor or a convict, he puts me out wherever I go. Now, I will live and I will wait, and there is no use, because I, will, I cannot take my life. Now I shall live and wait for our good Lord calls me. Dear Father, I will say nothing against the bishop, but you may think that I was called by our divine Lord to erect the first parish school in Texas and succeeded in erecting 22. <laughs> Perhaps the devil is jealous, and by means of the present persecution will hinder the good work that could be done in Anaheim. That could have been easy for you. No, it wasn't. 
Unable to do what I was called for, I took away my habit and moved in with my brother, Louis Felton, and helped raise his seven children in San Jose, California, after his wife died. How sad. Eventually, she was able to return to the congregation and retake her vow, but only after the passing of Bishop Neres. After all that, she still wanted to come back? When you love something, when it is your life, you can never truly turn away from it. You're young now, but when you're older, you'll understand. What happened to her? Did she get her job back? No, it doesn't work that way. Mother Florence was still in charge. Awkward. <laughs> you know, they were two <laughs> working towards the same goal. Mother Andrew spent her final five years in the mother house in Castro. But, before passing, she was able to see Our Lady of the Lake, which was opened by Mother Florence in... 1896. I know that one. Mom finished her graduate degree in 1996 on the centennial anniversary of Olu. Very good. And do you know what it was named? Our Lady of the Lake University. No, it was Our Lady of the Lake Academy. It was a private boarding school for girls. Boarding school? Mother Florence's term as Superior General saw a rapid growth in the parish, and during her time, 47 schools were accepted by the congregation. There was parish schools, free public schools, and private schools like Olu. How'd they get from Castroville to San Antonio? Mainly out of necessity. They needed railroad transportation for the sisters. Castroville didn't have it, but San Antonio did. And then Providence intervened, and Mayor Henry Elmendorf offered them 16 acres by Lake Elmendorf, where it sits today. The first building was main building, and the school spread out from there. That's where the fire started. In 2008, I remember watching it burn and thinking of all the hard work the sisters had put into building it. But we rebuilt it, and it is better than ever. It's beautiful. Still looks like a castle. When did it become a university? Not until 1975, a year after I started my bachelor's degree in history. It was still an academy? Mother Florence's term as superior general saw a rapid growth. During her time, Mother Angelique Ayres and Mother Philothea Theory came in and did their work. What about Mother Florence? Around the end of her fourth or fifth term as Superior General, <laughs> Mother Philothea became the superior of faculty, and Father Constantinou became the first president. Together, they ran the college. Then, around the end of Mother Florence's sixth term in 1943, Mother Angelique Ayres became the Superior General and Academic Dean of College. She was the first American-born Superior General. Really? And Dr. McMahon, who succeeded Father Constantinou, became the first lay president. He served for 32 years. And Mother Angelique? She is considered the dreamer and the builder of Olu because of the vision she had and how the school grew during her time as, superior, as dean. She established many programs, like the education program. She also established the first school of social work in Texas, the Warden School, and the first speech and hearing center in Texas, the Jersey Center. Very good. <laughs> Do you know what else? What? She was an English professor and a poet, an academic and an artist like you. What did she write about? Providence. This procession of the years began with two cross bearers, with radiant upturned faces set forth on the uncharted road, others who beheld their hopeful zeal, vision, the brightness of all eternity, joined by the slowly growing caravan and forming an ever lengthening line of inspired crusaders. But along the march, one side here and there, beneath the burden of the cross fell the weak or the timorous of the heart, and on the other, the brave, undaunting, having reached their destined end, planted to their crosses, glorified, and passed on to eternal presence. But still the procession presses on, every brave cross-bearer singing in her heart, praise and bless 
be divine providence now and forever. Amen. She also wrote about progress and legacy. Link by link these blessed years, wrought by enduring precious ore of sacrificial lives, having grown into jeweled, gleaming chains, lives that ran like priceless vein through the devious gloom of earth and time, till bursting through the clogging mire, they shine for all eternity. Chains that swing from earth to heaven, binding hearts with love divine. Dear God, we bring you our meat of thanks for jeweled years and sainted souls and beg you to transmute our dross into new love and new links and timeless love. Around the time she retired in 1960, she'd left her own legacy and paved the way for future links like Sister Elizabeth Ann Sultanfutt who was the university's fourth president and first female and sister in the position. She served for 19 years until 1997. And then, in 2013, there was Sister Jane Ann Slater, who was the university's <laughs> interim president. She sought the university during a rough patch after the last lay president. She's the chancellor of the Archdiocese of San Antonio, right? The first woman ever in her position. <laughs> of Divine Providence sure had a lot of firsts. Do you ever think Father Moy imagined his project would go this far? I don't know, but he did say that God's providence well, governs all things, provides for everything, arranges everything, and turns everything to good. He believed that if it was God's will, providence would behave a way. Providence of my God, I adore you in all your designs. I place my destiny in your hands, confiding to you all that I have, all that I am, and all that I am to become. My body and soul, my health and reputation, my life, my death, and my eternal salvation. As I rely entirely upon you and expect all from your goodness, I will not give myself up to any useless anxiety. I confide to you the success of all my undertakings. And in all difficulties, I have recourse to you as a never-failing source of help. I know that you will either preserve me from the evils I dread, or turn them to my good and your glory. Peaceful and contented in all, I will allow your providence to govern my life without worry or over-eagerness. Holy, wise, generous, and loving providence, I thank you for the tender care you have taken of me to this moment. I humbly and earnestly entreat you to continue the same for me. Direct all that I do, guide me in your ways, govern me every moment of my life, and bring me to the fullness of being you have destined for me from all eternity. May I please you and give you glory forever. So if he never had faith, there would have never been the project. And no sisters, no Our Lady of the Lake University, and for myself, your mother, and now you, no degrees. <laughs> <laughs> it's all connected, linked, like Mother Angelique said. And it continues today, not just here with us, but in Houston and the Rio Grande Valley, and who knows where else in the future. Oh. It's mom. Hi, Mom. Yeah, she's right here. Let me see. Mom wants to take me out to dinner, celebrate. Do you want to come? I would like that very much. She says yes. Okay, I will. Love you, too. <laughs> she's on her way. Be here in a minute. I guess I better clean up. <laughs> I am so very, very proud of you. Thank you, Will. Let us leave the future to Providence and take advantage of the present. Let's go. 
Let us do everything that depends on us, and God will take care of everything that concerns us. Whatever happens, everything will turn to the glory of God and our benefits.